grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's sure word this morning does serve as a foundation for our message. The Gospel reading is the primary text, but again, I want you to keep in mind those words of the Old Testament from the prophet Amos, where he speaks what sounds to be very harsh words, but God is calling out our hypocrisy with the hypocrisy of the people of that day. Saying, listen, you can go through the motions, you can say all of the things that you want to say. You can pat yourselves on the shoulder and, and, and feed your own self-confidence and your egos, but what's truly important to me is the condition of your heart and your unwavering humility and faith in me. And so God encourages us and challenges us with those words as well. Several years ago, there was a commercial on TV. It was a Milky Way commercial. And in one of the scenes of the commercial, a man is getting a tattoo where he said, I want a tattoo that says, no regrets on my arm. Perhaps you recall this commercial, but the lady who was giving him this tattoo got lost in the enjoyment of eating her Milky Way, that instead of tattooing no regrets onto his arm, she tattooed no regrets onto <laughs> What are some of your regrets? What is regrets? What are some of the regrets that you have from your past? Inevitably, we probably all have things that looking back now, we think, I don't know that I should have done that. Assuming that for the most part, outcomes would still be the same, what moments decisions of your life are you less than proud of. We all have those moments where we do something silly, where we wish we had not done a thing. I came across an article that spoke of a young lady who worked for years as a nurse in palliative care. She worked with patients who were nearing the end of their lives whether it was cancer or some other sickness or disease, they had something that medicine and doctors could not cure. And so it was her job to make them comfortable as they came closer and closer to the end of their lives. And she reflected on her blog, which later became a book, on some of the regrets that she would most commonly hear from her patients. Some of the things that she would hear over and over again from different people. She summarized them in these five primary regrets, which I thought might be helpful for us to consider this morning. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not just the life that others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so long. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with some of my friends. I wish that I had let myself be happy. Perhaps some of those regrets resonate with you. Perhaps just in a conversation about regret, there are certain things from your past that come immediately to mind. We don't want to beat ourselves up over these things. But we certainly want to change aspects of our living today and, and parts of our lives now so that when our time does come to an end, we are not sitting there with regret after regret. And I want you to think of this idea of having regrets as we look closer at this gospel reading. Because our gospel reading today is Jesus sounding the alarm. Get ready. Be prepared and try to uh, salvage the lives and the minds of people so that there is no regret. He's not talking about regret we have for this world, but he's talking about spiritual regrets with earthly and eternal, with eternal consequences. We are now in that time of the church year with Advent just on the horizon. 
where we spend the next three weeks looking at the end times, anticipating Jesus coming back. We say this every week in the creed. We look forward to Jesus coming back, the resurrection of the dead, Jesus coming to judge the sheep and the goats. We'll hear that in a couple of weeks. Jesus is coming back. As much as he has saved and redeemed us, as he, much as he has prepared a place for us in heaven, he still has some unfinished business. And that we see play out all over this world with evil and in sin. God has some unfinished business. And so in these last few weeks of the church here, we are getting ready. We are anticipating that unfinished work of God and the return of Christ. And so in these texts, we're going to hear things like, get ready, wake up, be prepared. God kind of shaking us so that, as we hear it in Amos, he's not just talking to people who do one thing because it's the church thing to do, but believe something different, where their hearts are far from God. Jesus is getting us to wake up, to really give ourselves some sort of a reality check where we say, okay, am I really, truly trusting in the Lord? Do I believe what I pretend to believe on Sunday morning? Or am I just pretending? And so that's what we're going to look at today with our gospel reading. In the verses just before Matthew 25, the things that we heard, we did find Jesus' disciples saying to Jesus, All right, Jesus, uh, tell us more about this last day. Tell us more when you come back for that final time with trumpets blaring and all the company of heaven behind you and you separate the sheep and the goats and you do all of these miraculous, powerful things. Tell us more about that. And, and more specifically, could you let us know when that's going to happen? Because if we could circle that date on our calendar, we would be ready for it. And so Jesus said to them, hold on guys, therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Even Jesus in that moment did not know the day of his return. He said only the Father in heaven is aware of that. And so you need to live your lives 24-7 on the ready. Don't get lazy. Don't become complacent. God is coming. Be ready. So to that point, he tells this story. This parable of ten virgins. So says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their legs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. And we won't get into the history of weddings of that day, but ultimately, the bridesmaids would go out and they would wait for the bridegroom to come and get the bride. And so they were not ever really sure when that bridegroom was coming back because he had to go and get his affairs in order, he had to secure a job, he had to prepare a house, he had to prepare a wife, so that when he came, to give his bride, he could take her and begin a life together. And so the bridesmaids are, are there, and, and they don't exactly know when the groom is coming, but they know he's coming eventually. So Jesus uses this very relevant analogy for what the kingdom of heaven will be like. He says there are ten women, five are wise, ten are foolish. The word for foolish is where we get our word for moron. Ten who were smart, ten who were, or five who were smart, five who were morons. So what is Jesus' point here? The contrast here is not between the faithful and the pagan. That would be easy for us to see. This is not necessarily, oh, here are those who are in church, and here are those who are on the golf course. Here are those who believe, and here are those who do not believe. Here are those who, you know, seem to trust in the Lord, and here are the ones who want nothing to do with it. That's not what Jesus is depicting here. All ten women are in the same place. They all look the same. They all act the same. They're all holding lamps. 
and yet five are wise and five are foolish. You see, the point here is much more direct. It's much more closer to home. What God is calling us to here is he's saying, listen, there are the believers, those who genuinely trust, and then there are those who are the main believers, who go through the motions, who do things because it's what they've always done. They've been conditioned to worship. It's part of their patterns of life, but it's not truly who they are and what they're about. And this is a significant distinction because now we're not just talking about us and them. Now we're talking about us and us. So Jesus says, do not be a make believer. Jesus warns that not everyone invited into the kingdom of heaven will be there because they lack the living and genuine faith. There are no bandwagon invites into the kingdom of heaven. In that moment, what God looks at is the condition of our heart, and if we truly trust and believe in the Savior, that's what it's truly all about. This picture of these ten women indicates to us a message that seems strange. But as we consider what does it look like for us to get ready, to be prepared, to have our affairs in order, we would do well to look at it again. Because you have those five wise who get to go into the bank of heaven, and you have those five foolish who stand knocking, begging at the door. And it does sound harsh. It's unforgiving. We talk time and time about a God who is, un who is continuing after to chase after us. He's relentless in His love and His mercy. But in this moment, something changes. Why? Because in this moment, this is the end. This is the last day. There is no more second chances. This is the time when Jesus comes to separate the good from the bad. And in that moment, where you stand before God is where you will stand into eternity. And so this strikes a very different tone than some of the parables and some of the readings that we have heard previously, where God was trying to say, during your time upon earth, to make every effort to be faithful and to follow me and to trust me and bring in all of the outsiders because all are welcome in the kingdom. Well, here, Jesus says, in that moment when I return, time's up. And there will be some who rejoice and who celebrate. And you and I, thanks be to God, will be those who sit in the presence of the Savior. And we sing praises because we have been saved and redeemed by Jesus Christ. But there are others who will not. And that's the word of caution in this prayer. You're either in or you're out. You're saved or you're damned. There are no second chances here. So ready or not, be prepared. And it sounds harsh. But ultimately the reason it sounds so harsh is because we also need to consider what's at stake. And God is warning us of His justice, but He's also reminding us of His incredible love. The reason he's sounding alarms is because he wants everybody to be in. We read this from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Read these words with me. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God loves everybody. And he wants all people to have a place at the wedding banquet in heaven. He wants all of us to dwell with him into eternity. But the reality is, in that moment, on that last day, not only is his mercy going to be evident, but all those who have rejected are going to have to deal with his justice. So the reason God is sounding the alarm is so that more people will break their hearts of stone 
and grasp onto their Savior and say, Lord, I believe. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for saving me. And so while all these other parables leading up until this point were about bringing more people in, this is a place where God says, okay, now it's time for you to look in the mirror. Remember when you've gotten on an airplane, and when they're going through their safety announcements, they always say, before you help anybody else, you have to do one. Put on your own mask. Because you can't help anyone you can't save anyone if you yourself are not saved first. And I think this parable gets us to look in the mirror and say, okay, am I truly saved? And this is not about looking at our good works. This is not looking at all of the things that we think we've done. But this is ultimately saying, do I believe in Jesus Christ? Do I understand that I am a poor, miserable sinner and that I need to confess about all of my sins and iniquities because I have failed. But thanks be to God, He has set forth a way out. He has redeemed me by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do I truly believe that? And when we answer yes, as we just did in the creed, when we receive the body and blood of our Savior, we are assured and we are comforted again by God's mercy. Knowing that we are saved. And so these women who seem so selfish, these five selfish women who are prepared, are, are not really selfish at all. What they remind us is that you cannot get to heaven on somebody else's good faith. This is something I've told every confirmation kid that I've ever worked with. It doesn't matter what mom and dad believe. It does not matter what grandma and grandpa believes. It does not matter what your spouse believes. None of that will help you or save you. We pray that they serve as good models and examples of the faith, but that's not what's going to save you. Good effort, good intentions notwithstanding, the only thing that matters is that when it comes to your flax, it is filled with your own good, genuine, heartfelt faith. These women were not prepared. They thought they had time. But the bridegroom showed up. Well, well, give me some years. We've had some despair. And the women said, no, this is mine. This is my faith. This is my oil. I cannot give to you. This is for me. This is what feeds me. This is what sustains me. This is what ensures that my relationship with the groom, the king, is intact. I can't just give it to you. Even if I wanted to, it doesn't work that way. So get ready. Be prepared. Don't be foolish. And fill your own with flames. Through prayer, through worship, through doing what you're doing right now, walking with the Lord, continue to let that fill your flames. Because by faith, God is through it. And he, is, he continues to be relentless in his pursuit of his people. And he's faithful to every promise that he's made. He says, if you trust in me, if you keep oil in your flask, you have nothing to fear. For when I do show up on that day and that hour which nobody knows about, I will be there to bring you unto myself. So that you have no regrets. So that you don't miss out at all. These words that closed our reading. But while they were still on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and yet the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. May we never hear those words. 
But know that if you trust in your God, you never will. Thanks be to God for his love and mercy that has said, you are ready when you trust in me, when you see your Savior. Let us pray. Dear God in heaven, it can be a scary thing to even begin to wrestle with hearing those words from our Heavenly Father. Truly, I tell you, I did not know you. And so, Lord, this text serves to challenge us, to shake us a little bit, to get us to look in the mirror and say, okay, what, what about me? Do I truly believe? Do I truly trust? And when we do that, we understand that it's not about our words. It's not about whether we've done enough or if we're good enough. It's simply about do we believe in our Savior Jesus Christ? Do we believe that he died and rose for us? Do we believe that he alone is what saves and redeems us and brings us into the eternal reign? So, Lord, for all of those who are outside and who are ill-prepared, I pray simply that you would just soften their hearts so that they might see in you the only way unto salvation. And for those of us who, who sit here with oil in our flasks, with faith in our heart, we simply pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for who you are and for what you've done for us. For you have taken it out of our hands completely. It's not up to us, but it's only because of Jesus that we are saved. What a beautiful, powerful, confident hope that is. Lord, we pray that you will keep us faithful until that last day. Or until that day that you call us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.